All right, folks. So what we have here is an Alpha Delta. It's a four port switch. And so you can see the model number here is a Delta four, and that indicates four. Now, when you look at the top of this, you see five. So you say, how in the heck is it four when there's five? This center uh, connector, this is an SO239, is your common. And so this is for whatever resource is going to share the other ports. So let me explain real quick how this works. What you can do is, is that you can feed your radio into your common port, and then you can have four different antennas connected. So maybe you have a dipole, maybe you have something that's uh, an infed, and you have a Yagi or directional or something, whatever. And a lot of times you'll see people who actually put a dummy load on here, and when they're not transmitting, they'll just switch the the dial to the dummy load, and then that way it's safe to transmit on the radio without anything going out over the air. And conversely, what you can do is that you can have um, one antenna and four radios. So maybe you have a big old multi-banded vertical or something like a, uh, like a DX Commander or something like that, and then you have four different radios and you share that. What's important about these devices is that you have isolation from these different ports. And what that isolation means that when I uh, transfer from a radio on port number one, that my signal is not going in and damaging my radio on port number two. So in the video today, we're going to do a bunch of stuff. We're going to test continuity. We're going to test for isolation. We're going to take it apart. We're going to look at the innards and see if this thing is fit for purpose. Now, I, I purchased this at... Uh, Hamvention uh, a few months ago and I was leaving and I was talking to a guy that we had made friends with uh, over the course of the event and uh, this was in a plastic bag and it was marked at 100 bucks which is a pretty good price for something like this and I've been wanting one for a while and I had extra money in my pocket that I didn't spend so I went ahead and I bought it. I got it home and opened it up and I noticed that it has a dent you can see that right here so it's got a little bit of physical damage to it but it doesn't impede switching anything and i really doubt that it's going to cause a problem on the inside but we'll take a look at it and see what's going on <clears throat> i mentioned it on uh one of the live streams and the guy contacted me right away and he was like hey i didn't know it was in a bag and i was like yeah it's not your fault it's just it just happened right and uh he was like i've got another one and i'll just send it to you and i told him don't worry about it man it's not it's not a big deal we'll, you know i'm sure it works fine and whatever it's not i don't don't care um so anyhow, what I want to do is I want to start testing this thing out and, and take a take a look at it. So we mentioned it has the five ports, the ones that come, and it has a dial here. And this is a, uh, I think they call it a lightning protector or, or a gas tube that goes in here. It doesn't really protect against a lightning strike. I don't think most things would. You would get arcing and stuff. But what it can protect is against a big surge that could cause you some problems. And then in the instructions, it also says that the user supplies the hardware to ground to your station ground via this uh, grounding terminal right here. <clears throat> so what I wanted to do, and I have one of my favorite multimeters, this is the Kai Wheats HT-118A. And uh, I'm going to turn this on. I'm going to set it so we can measure continuity. And when I would do that, I want to hit this function button and you get this little speaker sound. Now, when we measure continuity, hopefully you can hear that beep, <clears throat> and it is making sure that we have conductivity uh, in out one port and into the other port via the probes. So right now we're set to our common, and uh, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to see if we had continuity across the grounding or the shield side of all these ports. And it looks like it looks like we do. Um, the other thing is, is that I shouldn't have continuity between any of the center conductors. So when I put this in here, I get nothing. All right, so now that we have that, let's get this out of the way. Uh, what I want to do is I'm going to open this baby up and we're going to see what's doing inside. Let's just take a quick look and see what we have right here. It says manufactured at our ISO 9001 facility for highest reliability. See enclosed instruction sheet for significant operational and manufacturing improvements. All right. Well, we're going to take a look at that sheet anyway. Do not remove the back panel. No user serviceable, serviceable components inside. Do not over tighten the D4 arc plug. So that's what this thing's called, the arc plug. And uh, it says, if replacing only thumb tight with a screwdriver, do not operate with SWR higher than two to one 
at the antenna feed point. So that's something to take into consideration. Um, if you have an antenna that needs to be tuned, does that mean you can't use this? And then I guess, where do you put your tuner? So if you had one radio and four antennas, uh, you can't put your tuner here and then your radio behind that because you're going to have higher than two to one potentially on all of these ports. So I, I guess you would have to use multiple radios and one antenna and then your tuner here and then your antenna here. So it's a little bit of an interesting thing. Um, this is supposedly rated to full legal limit, which is 1500 watts. So that's going to come into our conversation later on as well. This would be our arc plug. Let's just put that over there so nothing happens to it. <clears throat> All right, I'm having trouble getting this apart, so I'm assuming that this sticker needs to come off. Well, 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 would you look at that? And that's why I was having some trouble there. This whole case feels like it's metal, except for this piece here. And this piece does feel like it's plastic, but I'm not 100% sure. So here we have some sort of insulator. Uh, you can see that. And I guess that pushes up against this. Maybe it's this button, but uh, here are the insides. And then you can see, we just have these metal strips that go through and it looks like there is a roller there. And as it goes across, you can see it pushing these strips up and then making contact to this particular piece of metal, which is soldered to this center piece. <clears throat> so as I move this, it lifts this up and makes contact through this bar to our to our strip here on our common. So let's go. Ahead. Okay, as I'm putting this thing back together, one of the things I wanted to point out is is that this insulator actually goes up here, not down here, like I incorrectly said earlier. So if you're watching and you saw me say that incorrectly, no need to call it out. Um, we're just going to screw this back together, and I'm going to come back and show you how we connect it to the Nano VNA to measure isolation. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly show how we're going to do this test. Now, you could do this backwards, but it doesn't really matter. So what we're going to do from the Nano VNA is we're going to send a signal out of channel zero. And it's going to come in here like if it was an external antenna or a radio going through a shared antenna. And it's going to come in here and it's going to run through. We're going to have the switch set to number one. We're also going to test number four and see if there's a difference. And then the signal is going to come out the common port and back into the VNA. And so what we're going to measure in this particular case is called insertion loss. And that's how much loss we get when we put a signal through the Delta four switch. Now, what I wanted to show everybody was the instructions that came with the Delta four switch. And then here you can see a data table and it's saying at 30 megahertz, our DB and loss is 0.1 DB. At 150 megahertz, it's 0.15, and at 450, it is 0.5. And that's because we get some reactants at variable frequencies or various frequencies. So let's go ahead and do a sweep, and we're going to sweep from, I don't know, 1 megahertz all the way up to 500 megahertz. And then we'll see what our insertion loss is. We'll save that, and then we'll come back and measure it and compare it through port number four. Okay, so what we've done is we've connected our Nano VNA to our computer. We're running a software program called Nano VNA Saver. If you take a look in the upper left-hand corner, you can see our sweep control box right here. And our sweep is from 1 megahertz to 500 megahertz. And we are doing uh, 100 segments. So we've taken our span and we've divided into 100 individual segments. Each one of those segments has 101 data points, giving us a total of 10,100 data points all the way from one megahertz to 500 megahertz. And then you can see that depicted over here on our chart. This chart is called an S21 gain, and I've explained how that works uh, when we showed the Nano VNA connected to the Delta IV. And what you can see is at the center of this chart is 0, 0.0 gain. And if I highlight along here, we're just gonna use marker one, you can see up at the top of our marker table, a frequency. So right here, for example, we are at 41.7147 megahertz. I know that that's not a ham frequency, so just stay calm. <clears throat> and if we take a look, our loss is 0.025 dB, which is pretty much negligible. It's not a big deal. 
And if I click over here, we are in the six meter band and we have a negative gain of 0.048. Again, very low. Now, if we make a jump up to the two meter band in VHF world, uh, this is 144.885 megahertz. We actually start to see our gain go up and, well, you can see our, gain, our loss go up, I should say. And we're at negative 0 0.401 dB. And, you know, again, that's not really that big of a deal. But what you need to account for in your transmission line and your antenna system is all of your insertion loss along the way. So you might have a co coaxial cable that's lossy. So you have loss there. You may have a lot of connectors. You may have something like the switch is going to introduce some loss. And that does add up. And you should pay attention to that. If we take a jump all the way up here to our 70 uh, centimeter band and the highlight in there, this is 434. We are negative one point, I'm sorry, negative 1.961. And that's starting to get to be a little bit significant. Now, would I use this for um, UHF frequencies? Probably. I, I don't think I would worry about it too much, but it's something to be mindful of and something to pay attention to. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to set this as our current reference, and now it's highlighted in blue. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the Nano via NA up to port 4, and we're just going to see if there's a difference between the ports. I'm not going to do all of them because I don't want to make the video too long. So give me one second, and we'll be right back. Okay, our sweep is done, and when you look at the chart, you can't see our sweep, and that's because it's exactly neath, underneath the current reference or the reference from the first sweep. So what I'm going to do is just set this one as the current reference. And now we only have one. We're not doing a comparison. But as I highlight across, you can see the values are pretty much exactly the same where they were the first time around. So that's a good thing. What we're going to do now is we are going to do a little bit of an SWR test. And we're going to see if this uh, has any kind of impedance in it that we should be concerned about. So let me come back and I'll show you how we're going to test that. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is establish a baseline of our dummy load. Our dummy load is the MFJ261. Uh, and what we want to do is we just want to make sure that we get a baseline here because sometimes these have a little bit of reactance and we'll have a higher SWR reading at higher frequencies. And so we just have it connected to our channel zero port and it's coming through right into the dummy load. Now what we'll do when we test this against the delta switch is we'll connect the dummy load here to our common port and then we'll run SWR through port one and port four just like we did with the insertion loss test. So let's do this sweep and then get a reference point. Okay, we've run the sweep in Nano VNA Saver and something did change here. We changed our chart to an S11 VSWR chart. So it's no longer the S21 gain. And what I wanted to highlight here is, is that we do see some SWR coming up from the use of our dummy load. Now here it doesn't really do much. It's 1.1, let's see what we are right here. We are 1.16, which is a very good, very low SWR. But somewhere right around here, we start to get more noise on our signal. And we go all the way up to the 440 band right here. We see an SWR of 1.14. And uh, I think that's to be expected. So what we want to do now is, is that we want to compare the, uh, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to insert the alpha delta switch into our circuit. And then we're going to set this as our current reference. So now it's going to turn blue. And then we're going to see what this looks like when we run the sweep again. Okay, here's how we are set up for our first test. We have the nano VNA signal coming out channel one going into port one. Let's go ahead and set that. It's going to go through the internal mechanism that we looked at earlier, and then it's going to come out into this dummy load and then bounce all the way back in, and we're going to get a reading. So let's go to Nano VNA Saver and run our sweep. Okay, so here's Nano VNA Saver. We're going to run the sweep. And this should give us a comparison against our reference, which is the blue line. Okay, so this might be surprising to some people. What we're seeing here is that our SWR actually went down. Now you notice we have greater differences the higher in frequency we go, and that is a result of reactance. It's pretty much the same in the lower HF bands. And you might be saying, well, hey, how do you explain that the SWR went down when you inserted something into the circuit? Well, let's talk a little bit about that. And in order to do that, let me go back to the screen where you actually see the device, because it'll make it a little bit easier. 
Okay, when we send our signal out here and then straight into the dummy load like we had it before, it just reflects back and we have minimal loss as a result of this cable. When we did our insertion loss measurements through the Alpha Delta switch, we did see increasing insertion loss with higher frequency. So that insertion loss is encountered when we take a signal and we send it through, the signal that gets to our dummy load is weaker than the signal that came out of the nano VNA because of the insertion loss. So the reflected signal has to come back through and it gets doubled with the insertion loss and it comes back in here. So what you're seeing is a ratio from the original power source to the inserted loss signal reflected inserted loss again and it comes back through here. So by in introducing the insertion loss, it artificially makes our SWR look a little bit lower. It's not that the SWR changed on the dummy load, it's that we filtered it per se with the insertion loss of this. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna disconnect this and connect it over here and we're gonna compare the sweep that we just did to the sweep on port four and see if we notice any difference there. Okay, back in Nano VNA Saver, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the new trace as my current reference, and we're going to hit sweep, and we're going to run the sweep, and hopefully these come back looking the same. Okay, our sweep's done, and if we look down around 182 megahertz, you can see some deviation from the other sweep, and a little bit of deviation up here in some of the higher frequencies. But for me, the SWR that is... Uh, is a factor of the alpha delta switch is nothing to be concerned about it doesn't worry me at all or doesn't wouldn't give me any any concern if i was to use the alpha delta switch um, the insertion loss is something to be mindful of it's not something to be concerned about what we want to do now is we're actually going to do some tests and we are going to test the isolation of the ports we're going to see how that works okay so let's talk a little bit about the test that we're going to do now from the nano VNA, we're going to send a signal out channel zero, and it's going to come in through our common port. We have our switch set to number one, and so it's going to route our signal into the dummy load to be dissipated into the air forever. And what we're going to do here is we are going to see how much signal we get on port four, which is the furthest from where we're directing our signal. And this will tell us how much isolation we have between the two. Now we're going to get something, but I don't know what exactly we're going to get. So let's go ahead into Nano VNA Saver. We're going to run an S21 gain chart like we did earlier for the, um, for the um, insertion loss test. And then we'll be able to see how much of our signal we can detect over here when we want our signal to go out on channel one. Okay, so our sweep's done, and the chart's a little messy, so it's a little bit hard to read. But what we've done is, is that we've run the sweep, and what we are measuring is our isolation. And what we're saying is that on port 4, we were getting, this is, the marker is at uh, 50.75 megahertz. So we're saying at that frequency, we were getting a signal, uh, signal strength, of negative 75 dB down from the signal that we were sending in there. Um, so that is okay, I guess. It's maybe a little bit concerning. We're gonna do a practical demonstration with a radio and we're gonna see what the, what the impact of that was. But our isolation varied quite a bit with frequency and that's why this line is so messy. So if I click around right here at 38.5 megahertz, we had negative 80. Uh, down here at 12.31, uh, we had negative 86, but then if I click over here, maybe it, you can see that it goes up to 78. And then our isolation over here in the 70 centimeter band is around 60 dB down. Uh, so I would be a little bit concerned with that. What we're going to do is we're going to switch this from port 4 over to port 2, and that's going to be a little bit closer to where we're sending our signal. We're going to see if there's any difference. So let me set this as a uh, reference, and there it goes turning blue, and let's see what happens. Okay, the sweep's done, and what we can see is, is that it performed differently on some of the frequencies, and it looks like the variance really came into effect somewhere around here uh, when we are at around 100 megahertz. And now, because I like to understand how my equipment works and have some predictability in how it's going to perform, I think it's safe to say that uh, I'm, I'm going to have about negative 70 to negative 90 dB of isolation at 100 megahertz and below. Uh, once we start to get above that, this starts to act a little goofy and a little crazy. 
so because of that, I don't think I would use this alpha delta switch on uh, VHF and UHF frequencies because I would be worried about damaging my equipment. Now, granted, my signal that I'm going to be injecting at that level is probably somewhere around 50 watts. So maybe that's not such a big deal and I'm being a worry wart over nothing. Um, but taking a look at that, I, I am a little bit concerned about that. Um, now, what I'll say is, is that between negative 70 and negative 90, I think that is okay below 100, um, 100 uh, megahertz. When we take a look at the instructions, and let's go ahead and take a look at that now. So looking here at the instructions, what you can see is our dB isolation. Um, what it says, it says less than 60 uh, up to 30 megahertz and then less to 50. So the product's performing better than the specification in the document. So I, I don't know if, if I was pumping a uh, legal limit at 1,500 Watts, I think I would be concerned about damaging my equipment. And let me show you why. <clears throat> okay. So what we have here is a quick chart that I put together and in the first upper left-hand corner gray box, what we have is hundred Watts. And I used a calculator to convert this to DBM and that gives us 50 DBM. So if I have negative 80 dB of isolation, for example, I'm still pumping in a signal that is negative 30 dBm. And uh, when I think about signal strength, negative 74 dBm is an S9 signal. So if I take an S9 plus 40 or 40 over S9 is how we would read that as amateur radio operators, that gives me negative 34 dBm. So in this particular case with 100 watts, I'm really putting in a stronger than S9 plus 40 signal. If I was using 1500 watts uh, depicted in the second gray box, a little bit lower down, that is 61.7 dBm. And if I subtract 80 from that, that says that I'll be putting in negative uh, 18.3 dBm. Now, again, we take our negative 74 dBm, our S9 signal, plus 60. So this would be 60 over S9. Um, that signal is negative 14 dBm. So I'm going to be putting in close to an S9 plus 60 if I'm using 1500 watts with negative 80 dB of isolation. Below 100 watt, 100 megahertz, we actually saw that go as high as negative 70. So that would make me a little bit concerned. Using this switch in the HF frequencies at 100 watts is probably no big deal. But what we're going to do now is we're going to inject a signal from my ICOM 7300 at 100 watts into the Alpha Delta switch. And then we're going to read that on a different port uh, to see what our isolation is into our IC705. So let me come back after I get that set up. Okay, so for this test, what we've done is this green cable runs out to the back of my IC7300. And I have that set on 100 watts of output, and we're going to inject a RIDI signal in here. And then using this switch, we have it directed out port one. On port four, what we have is a coaxial cable that runs around and goes into my IC7300. And that is set to everybody's favorite frequency of 7200. Now, for the sake of time and brevity, we're not going to test this on every band. We're just going to test it on one. So let me go ahead and turn on the screen right here. And that should give you a view of my 7300. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to key up. Actually, let me just do this so everybody believes, believes me. If I hit this button, you can see my RF power is at 100%. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to key up. And it looks like we're getting an S5 signal on the IC705. And I expected to get a lot higher than that based off the calculations that we did. So this could be maybe we're at a 90 uh, dB um, measurement as opposed to some of the higher ones. So even though I said we weren't going to do it, let's just go ahead and turn this up a little bit here. I don't know. Let's go to 7215. And let's turn this one to 72.15 while we're at it. And let's go ahead and do it again. And we are still at around an S5 signal. Maybe my math was wrong. Maybe I got this thing set up in differently. Um, at this point, based off what I'm seeing here, I've got zero problems using this. Um, 
when the HF frequency is at 100 watts. I'd want to do some more testing at UHF and VHF, and I'd want to do some more testing if I was going to run any power higher than 100 watts. But um, I guess we're going to go ahead and give the Alpha Delta a pass. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, criticisms, anything like that, go ahead and post them below, and I'll do my best to respond. Appreciate it.